My name is Lou Wongberg, and I'm pleased to welcome you to one of my presentations on a variety of history and government related subjects. We explore as many different variations and we try to find out the story behind the story to ask the question of why did this happen and to look at the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the various personalities who have made history. Most of the time we focus on US history but once in a while we will stray into variations that happen in the world. Anyway, I hope that you are able to enjoy this presentation that will be coming and that you come and join with us frequently as these will be appearing on YouTube as they are recorded from week to week. And with that, I welcome you to Lou Wongberg's presentations in the world of history and government. One of the most puzzling things to most Americans and to the rest of the world is this thing that we call the Electoral College. It is an unusual way of selecting a leader and it has many flaws, but it has worked for all of these 230 some years since the Constitution was ratified in 1789. Hey, what we're going to do today is take a look at the Electoral College and to explain it. And then we're going to take a look at some of the options for the Electoral College that have been proposed by scholars and other people who have studied this so over the years. we have the Electoral College that is... So we have this thing that's called the United States Electoral College. So what are we going to do? We're going to take a look at what is it, this odd animal. Secondly, should we change it? We've had it with us all these years. Is it time for us to do something different? And what options do we have? And what will happen if we were to exercise some of those options? In the, the preamble to the Constitution states that we, the people, and this is the important part of it, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And by the way, the spelling uh, matters in the preamble are as it is originally written. Some essential understanding of this thing called the Electoral College. First of all, the United States Constitution itself is a bundle of compromises. That's how they intended for it to be, and that's how they arrived at it. The very nature of the Constitution forces leaders towards the middle. There have been five great compromises. First of all, the one called the Great Compromise, which provided a dual system of congressional rep representation. The House was based on population or the people, and the Senate was based on the states. They adopted a thing called the Three-Fifths Compromise, a Commerce Compromise, and finally, and per persistently most controversial, a Slave Trade Compromise. And finally, the way in which the president is elected, it's the Electoral College. You need to understand the Electoral College was a compromise. First of all, the Constitution is a compact of the states, is it? Compact theory holds that the country was formed through a compact agreed upon by all the states and that the federal government is thus a creation of the states. It's a fundamental understanding. Consequently, states should be the final arbiters over what the federal government, whether the federal government has overstepped the limits of its authority as set forth in the compact. Or is the Constitution a compact of the people? The federal government is not a compact among the states, but was instead formed directly by the people in their exercise of their sovereign power. 
the people determined that the federal government should be superior to the states. Under this view, the states are not parties to the Constitution and do not have the right to determine for themselves the proper scope of federal authority, but instead are bound by the determinations of the federal government. Now, these two points of view are essential in terms of current arguments that go on in the United States. So what were they thinking in 1787? When they debated the Constitution, they hated the idea. They really hated with a passion the idea of a democracy. They saw it as mobocracy. Shays Rebellion had just taken place in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts, and, and the rule of the unenlightened. Instead, what they chose was a republic. No major nation of the civilized world at that time was a republic. Democracy is not mentioned even once in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, or in the Bill of Rights. So what are the main difference? What is the main difference and why are there many? The biggest one is that the democracy, in democracy, the majority must rule anytime and all the time that they have half or more of the votes. In a republic, the rights of the minorities must be considered protected as appropriate. So they constructed a government with three separate branches that check each other. They required that the members of Congress and the president stand for re-election. They created states with separate powers from the national government. We call this federalism. They created two branches of Congress that could and do check each other. And they ruled that the Supreme Court can overrule the actions of the other bodies. So what are the main difference? And there are many. First of all, overturning a veto is difficult. It takes two thirds of both the House and the Senate in order to overturn a veto. Amending the Constitution itself is difficult. It requires two thirds of both houses. Then you need the ratification of three quarters of the state or Congress must call a convention for proposing amendments upon application of the legislatures of two thirds of the states. This has never happened, by the way. The Senate has the filibuster, controversial as it is, especially today. And so it goes, many, many structural parts that protect minority rights so that laws are difficult to pass and require broader agreement and consensus. Main difference, they also created this animal called the Electoral College, which has not quite turned out the way they envisioned it, but nevertheless does afford protections for minorities to a greater extent than the popular vote alone. So when you hear or we hear calls to throw out the Electoral College, and we hear a lot of them, especially in election years, it's almost impossible to do it. Pause and consider how important it is to protect and advance every person in our culture. So in 2016, going back four and a half years now, did 2016, did we protect minorities? In that election, Clinton had 65, almost 66 million votes, 48.5%. Trump had 60, almost 63 million, 46.5%. The total margin was 2,868,000 plus for Clinton. California alone, California had eight, Clinton had 8,753,000. 8, Trump had 4,483,000. The margin there alone was 4,269,000. The majority rules, but how about those minorities? Clinton carried 20 states plus the District of Columbia. Trump carried 30 states. Clinton cover, carried 500 counties. Trump carried 2,600. Most Clinton voters were urban, most Trump voters were rural. Is it geography versus people? Which prevails? The Electoral College, the uh, 2008 presidential results under the 2010 census reapportionment, and you see each state has a different number of electoral votes. They are equal to the number of representatives that they are entitled to, 
plus the number of senators. For example, in Florida, we had 27 members of Congress, the House of Representatives, two members of the Senate, you add those together, you get 29. To these are added three from the District of Columbia, so they have a vote uh, in the presidential race. This particular map shows the power of your vote in your state if there was no electoral college. Notice that four states in particular would predominate, New York, Florida, Texas, and California, with a sop thrown in for Illinois and Ohio. But that would be where it was be determined. This is what the television map looked like on election night. But if you do it county by county, this is what you get. Large swaths of red throughout the nation. Election night cartogram. By the way, those representations are called cartograms. Uh, and this is when you do a counter cartogram by county. Here's a cartogram done by population, similar to what you saw a moment ago in a different way. And if done by electors, and there is some parallel between the two. So the Electoral College, why? Why the Electoral College? Well, in 1787, the Virginia Plan was the basis submitted by James Madison for early debate in the Constitution. Congress was to select the president. Lengthy debates resulted from that in the Great Compromise, or sometimes called the Connecticut Compromise, and the Three-Fifths Compromise. Later in the summer, late August, they had a committee of detail that was to prepare the final draft. Governor Morris was in charge of this, and he said there were fears of intrigue if the president were chosen by a small group of men who met together regularly, and concerns for the independence of the president if elected by the Congress. So the electoral college, various methods for selecting the executive were discussed, were debated, reviewed, and discarded during the Constitutional Convention. Should the president be named by the legislative body? Should the president be chosen directly? Should the president be chosen by governors? Should the president be chosen by some form of a lottery? And then the Electoral College was proposed. A decision resulted only late in the convention when the Committee of Detail presented executive election by special electors selected by the state legislatures. The compromise preserved states' rights, increased the independence of the executive branch, and avoided a popular election. In this plan, Congress plays a formal role in the election of the president and vice president, while members of Congress are expressly forbidden from being electors, the Constitution requires the House and Senate to count the Electoral College's ballots and in the event of a tie to select the president and vice president respectively. And we saw much controversy on January 6, 2021. Uh, in regard to the House and Senate counting the Electoral College ballots. On August 24th, 1787, the delegates turned to the presidential article and created the Committee of Detail report and rejected four different modes of electing the president. In the end, the convention selected members of the Brearley from New Jersey committee, whose main objective was to settle the presidential election clause. The Brerley Committee proposed the adoption of an electoral college in which both the people and the states were represented in the election of the president. The president was to be elected for four years and to be eligible for re-election. September 4th to 6th, there was debate and action. Some delegates preferred popular election of the executive. Madison said a popular vote would be ideal but difficult given the prevalence of slavery in the South. The right of suffrage were more diffusive in the Northern than the Southern states and the latter could have no influence in the election of the scores of Negroes. The substitution of electors obliviated this difficulty. 
I obviated this difficulty and seemed on the whole to be liable to the fewest objections, again, compromise. Alexander Hamilton, commenting later in Federalist number 68, observed that the electors come directly from the people and them alone for that purpose only and for that time only. This avoided a party run legislature or a permanent body that could be influenced by foreign interests before each, each election. The election was to take place among the states so no corruption in any state could taint the great body of the people in their selection. The choice was to be made by a majority of the electoral college as majority rule is critical to the principles of Republican government. The electors meeting in state capitals were given, were, were, to, were able to have information unavailable to the general public. Alexander Hamilton further says, since no federal office holder could be an elector, none of the electors would be beholden to any presidential candidate. The decision would be made without tumult and disorder, as it would be based, a broad-based one made simultaneously in various locales where the decision makers could deliberate reasonably, not in one place where decision makers could be threatened or intimidated. Furthermore, he said, if the electoral college did not achieve a decisive majority, then the House of Representatives was to choose the president from among the top five and later after the 12th Amendment three candidates. Concerned about somebody's unqualified, but with a talent for low intrigue and the little arts of popular, popularity attaining high office. In number 10, in Federalist number 10, Madison says, an interested and overbearing majority and the mistress of faction in an electoral system. A faction as a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority, the whole who are united and actuated by some common purpose of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. In other words, mobocracy. They were concerned about factions. They didn't want these willful small groups having undue influence. What was then called Republican government, federalism as opposed to direct democracy, with its varied distribution of voter rights and powers would countervail against factions. Furthermore, James Madison goes on, the greater the population and the expanse of the Republic, the more difficulty factions would face in organizing due to such issues as sectionalism. The phrase electoral college, nor any other name is used to describe the electors collectively. It was not until the early 19th century that the name electoral college came into general usage. This is a little brief exploration, explanation of the Electoral College. In the U.S., presidents are not elected via popular vote. Instead, the U.S. uses the Electoral College. The Electoral College provides a certain number of electors to states based on its congressional representation. For example, a state like Wyoming has two senators and one member of the House of Representatives, so it has allocated three electoral votes. However, a state like California has two senators and 53 members of the House of Representatives, so it has 55 electoral votes. In a presidential election, each state and the District of Columbia hold individual elections that instead of people voting directly for the president, they vote on who they want their state's electors to vote for. During a presidential election, 48 out of 50 states and the District of Columbia are winner take all, which means whoever wins the most popular votes in that state gets all the electoral votes from that state. However, Nebraska and Maine distribute their electoral votes via their congressional districts. In 2008, Barack Obama won an electoral vote for Nebraska because he won Nebraska's second congressional district, giving McCain only four out of five electoral votes. In 2016, Donald Trump won in Maine's second congressional district, giving Hillary Clinton three out of four electoral votes from Maine. There are a total of 538 electors. A presidential candidate needs at least 270 electoral votes to win. 
Though typically Americans know who the next president is going to be in November, the president is not officially elected into office until the Electoral College meets in December. Though electors are people chosen to represent the candidate their state voted for, it is possible for an elector to defect and vote for someone other than who their state voted for. This is what is called a faithless elector. If both candidates fail to get at least 270 electoral votes, then the presidential election is decided through Congress. In this scenario, the House of Representatives decides who becomes the president, and the Senate decides who becomes the vice president. So what was the founders' intent? What were they really trying to do? What was their purpose? The original plan of the Electoral College was based upon several assumptions and anticipations of the framers. First of all, individual electors would be elected by citizens on a district by district basis. Each presidential elector would exercise independent judgment when voting. Candidates would not pair together on the same ticket with assumed placements towards each office of president and vice president. The system as designed would rarely produce a winner, thus sending the election to Congress, which did happen a couple of times, but it didn't work out very frequently. According to the text of Article 2, however, each state government was free to have its own plan for selecting its electors, and the Constitution does not explicitly require states to popularly elect their electors. Alexander Hamilton described the framers' view, a small number of persons selected by their fellow citizens from the general mass will be most likely to possess the information and discernment requisite to such complicated tasks. The founders assumed this would take place district by district, that plan was carried out by many states until the 1880s. Some states reasoned that the favorite presidential candidate among the people in their state would have a much better chance if all the electors selected by their state were sure to vote the same way, a general ticket of electors pledged to a party candidate. So the slate of electors chosen by the state were no longer free agents, independent thinkers, or deliberative representatives. They became voluntary party lackey, lackeys and intellectual non-entities. Once one state took that strategy, the others felt compelled to follow suit in order to compete for the strongest influence on the election. The founders assumed that electors would be elected by the citizens of their district and that their elector was to be free to analyze and deliberate regarding who is best suited to be president. Madison and Hamilton were so upset by what they saw as a distortion of the framers' original intent that they advocated for a constitutional amendment to prevent anything other than the district plan. Hamilton went further. He actually drafted an amendment to the Constitution in mandating that the district plan for selecting electors in 1802 be used. And that, of course, did not prevail. Since the Civil War, since the Civil War, all states have chosen the presidential electors by popular vote. The process has been normalized to the point that the names of the electors appear on the ballot in only eight states, Tennessee, Arizona, Idaho, Louisiana, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, and South Dakota. We're just going to underscore that when you vote for president, you are only voting for a slate of electors, even though it is the president's name or potential president's name that appears on the ballot, except in these states. Alternative methods for selecting electors, and here you see how they prevailed throughout the years. The years are over on the left, and then you see the, first of all, the states that uh, in 1789, the largest number were selected by actually state legislatures. At 1789. Popular vote district vote, legislative vote, and a hybrid vote. 
By the time we get to 1820, you notice the pattern has changed and we have the largest number who are now being elected by popular vote. And by 1832, all except two states vote by popular vote. The process, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 was an attempt to clarify the process. And it says that after November 3rd, this year, at least, or 2020, uh, county canvassing boards meet and they determine the final vote. And that varies by state, but most states, you know, by late November, the state canvassing board meets to certify the final vote. Recounts occur in some states if it's a difference of more than a quarter of a percent, some of them up as much as 1%, then a recount becomes automatic. Then no later than six days, December 8th in 2020, before the Electoral College, which in 2020 is December 14th, the governor in most states, as soon as practicable, prepares six certificates of ascertainment, which lists the names of the electors chosen by the voters, the number of votes, and the names of all other candidates for elector and the votes they receive. Six copies of the certificate of ascertainment are sent to the archivist of the United States by registered mail and under state seal. Six duplicates are sent to each elector. The electors gather in the state capitol again in 2020 on December 14th. The meeting shall take place as it's specified on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December, at which time they cast their electoral votes on separate ballots for president and vice president. Procedures in each state vary slightly. The meeting is opened by the election certification official, most often that is the state secretary of state or the equivalent who reads the certificate of ascertainment. When the time for balloting arrives, the electors choose one or two people to act as tellers. Some states provide for the placing and nomination of a candidate to receive the electoral votes, the candidate for the political president of the political party of the electors. <coughs> Each elector then submits a written ballot with the name of a candidate for president. The tellers count the ballot and they announce the result. The next step is the casting of the vote for vice president, which follows a similar pattern. Each state's electors must complete six signed certificates of vote. One is sent by registered mail to the president of the Senate, which is usually the incumbent vice president of the United States. Two are sent by registered mail to the archivist of the United States. Two are sent to the state secretary of state, and one is sent to the chief judge of the United States District Court for these electors, those electors meet. A staff member of the president of the Senate collects the certificates of vote as they arrive and prepares them for the joint session of Congress. Certificates are arranged unopened in alphabetical order in two special mahogany boxes, Alabama through Missouri, including the District of Columbia, and Montana through Wyoming are placed in the other box. And here you see a picture of the box and there you see the pages that are moving across Statuary Hall, carrying those boxes to the House of Representatives. The session is ordinarily required to take place on January 6th in the calendar year immediately following the meetings of the presidential electors. And we know what happened on January 6th, 2021. The meeting is held at one o'clock p.m. in the chamber of the U.S. House of Representatives. The sitting vice president is expected to preside, but in several cases, the president pro tem of the Senate has chaired the proceedings. The vice president and speaker of the house sit at the podium with the vice president in the seat of the speaker of the house. Each house appoints two tellers to count the vote, normally one member of each political party. Members of Congress can object to any state's vote count provided objection is presented in writing and is signed by at least one member of each House of Congress. Members of Congress can object to any state's vote count providing objection is presented in writing and is signed by at least one member of each House of Congress. 
An objection supported by at least one senator and one representative will be followed by the suspension of the joint session and by separate debates and votes at each House of Congress. After both houses deliberate on the objection, the joint session is resumed. Long process, isn't it? The state certificate of vote can be rejected only if both houses of Congress vote to accept the rejection. In that case, the votes from the state in question are simply ignored. The votes of Arkansas and Louisiana were rejected in the presidential election of 1872. Objections to the electoral vote count are rarely raised, although it did occur during the vote count in 2001 after the close 2000 presidential election between Governor George Bush of Texas and Vice President Al Gore. The state of the vote for President of the United States as delivered to the President of the Senate is as follows. The whole number of electors appointed to vote for President of the United States is 538, of which a majority is 270. Donald Trump of New York has received for President of the United States 304 votes. Hillary Clinton, the state of New York, has received 227 votes. The state of the vote for Vice President of the United States as delivered to the president of the Senate is as follows. The whole number of the electors appointed to vote for vice president of the United States is 538, of which 270 is a majority. Michael R. Pence of the state of Indiana has received for vice president of the United States 305 votes. Tim Kaine of the Commonwealth of, Tim Kaine of, the Commonwealth of Virginia has received 227. There will be order. <laughs> Senate arms were removed. arms will remove the professors from the gallery. In order, House. the Commonwealth of Virginia has received 227 votes. Elizabeth Warren of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts received two. Maria Cantwell, the state of Washington, has received one. Susan Collins, the state of Maine, has received one. Uh, Carly Fiorina of the Commonwealth of Virginia has received one. The sergeant arms remove the protesters from the gallery. The chamber will be in order. The change will be in order. One the Duke of the state of Minnesota has received one vote. This announcement of the state of the vote by the president of the Senate shall be deemed sufficient declaration of the persons elected president and vice president of the United States, each of each for a term beginning on the 20th day of January 2017, and shall be and shall be entered together with the list of the votes on the journal of the Senate and the House of Representatives. So here we have the system and how it has been presented and how it works. Now there are a lot of people who hate the system. And there are potential revisions. In fact, there have been over 700 proposals introduced in Congress to revise the Electoral College. One of those is a direct popular vote with a runoff with a 40% minimum. A congressional district plan, a proportional method dividing each state's electoral vote to mirror its popular vote. Majority preference voting in which voters rank their preferences and to keep the Electoral College in place, but add another 102 electoral votes. And finally, a national popular vote interstate compact. So let's look in more detail at these proposals. First, direct election with instant runoff voting. Instant runoff voting, IRB, would be used for presidential elections with or without the Electoral College. With a direct vote, voters would rank their preferences rather than marking only one candidate. Then when the votes are counted, if no single candidate has a majority, the candidate with the lowest number of votes is eliminated. Ballots are counted again, this time tallying the second choice votes from those ballots, indicating the eliminated candidate as the first choice. The process is repeated until a candidate receives a majority reducing time and money wasted in a normal runoff election. 
Proportional allocation of electoral votes. As a popular alternative, it splits each state's electoral votes in accordance with their popular vote percentages. A candidate who came in second place in a state with 45% of the popular vote would receive 45% of the electoral votes instead of 0% as it is now. One problem with this system is the question of how to allocate vote electors proportionately. Some suggest that one way to patch this problem of uneven electors would be to increase the number of electoral votes by a factor of 10 or 100 uh, or more to reduce the margin of error. In other words, the 538 times 10 equals 5,380 or times 153,800. Proportional allocation of electoral votes. You could round to whole votes, tenths votes, and a whole variety of decimal places beyond this. Each of those, though reducing the amount of error, would still permit error and not succeed as thoroughly in making each vote count equally. This would be difficult to pass on a nationwide basis and would most likely have to pass state by state. During this process, or even at the end, if some states do not adopt the process, one party might gain an unfair advantage. Problem with proportional. Let's look at some numbers here. This is the election between Bush and Gore, and the one between Clinton and Trump. Abolish the Electoral College with a popular vote. Uh, the most votes nationwide wins with or without a majority of the votes, Gore in 2000, Hillary in 2016. Requires a constitutional amendment and would therefore need the support of two thirds of Congress and three quarters of the states. A direct vote, however, would not eliminate the entrenchment of the two party system nor spoiler considerations of minor parties. In a close race, voting for a candidate from a minor party could reinforce the same spoiler dynamic as exists within the current system. There's a possibility that with multiple candidates, a winner could be declared with just a small plurality of votes instead of a strong majority. Also, a close election would require a nationwide recount rather than just recounting the states in question, which would make the process in such a situation much longer, incredibly much longer. And who loses? Low population states, more rural states. The state and congressional district method divides electoral votes by district, allocating one vote to each district and using the remainder two as a bonus for the statewide popular vote winner. Maine in 1972, Nebraska in 92. In 2008, Barack Obama won Nebraska's second district, which is basically Omaha, gaining a Democratic electoral vote in that state for the first time since 1964. In 2016, Donald Trump won Maine's second congressional district, which covers most of the state outside of Portland, Augusta, and nearby coastal areas. Statewide, Maine lost last voted Republican in 1988. The system does not address the disproportional aspects of the Electoral College. Using congressional districts to determine each elector would also draw more attention to the way districts are drawn already a hot topic in politics today. When we get to reapportionment in the various states, it can be agonizing and political and controversial and actually is uh, fraught with all kinds of uh, very difficult issues that are hard to resolve. District system results. Here we have, again, Bush, Gore, and other. And we have Trump, Clinton, and other. Uh, and you can see that if you did change to the district system, uh, you would, uh, in fact, uh, at, at the original election, Bush did win under the district system, he would still win. Uh, in the election of 2016, uh, we would estimate that Trump would still have won the election. So, if we take this uh, and, we, and we do some playing around with this under the district system uh, between Trump and Biden in the election, 
uh, we would probably wind up again with Biden winning uh, in the current 2021 election, 2020 election. The national bonus plan. This idea retains the current electoral college system, but awards extra electoral votes as a bonus to the winner of the popular vote. The amount suggested is 102 extra electoral votes, two for every state and two for Washington, D.C. The extra boost of electoral votes would be almost always be able to guarantee that the popular vote winner would also be the electoral college winner. This method does not eliminate the spoiler dynamic of third party participation, but it would encourage people to campaign and vote in non-competitive states in an attempt to win the popular vote. 640 possible, 320 in this case to win. In this case, in 2016, Trump would have had 306, Clinton would have had 232, uh, but she would have received an additional 102 and therefore would have had 336. And so under this formula, Clinton would have won in 2016. Binding proposal, amend the Constitution to bind all electors federally, meaning that they would be forced to vote based on their party's pledge if their party's nominee wins the state. This amendment would also enshrine the winner-take-all unit into the Constitution. What if the winner of the popular vote won the presidency? The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is an agreement between certain states to allocate their votes in the Electoral College based on the results of the National Popular Vote. That's radically different from the way that electoral votes are allocated right now. The Constitution gives each state a number of electoral votes equal to the total number of that state's senators and representatives in Congress. State legislatures have the power to choose the method of selecting their presidential electors, and all but two states give their electoral votes to the candidate who receives the most votes in that state. The other two award electoral votes based on which candidate wins each congressional district in those states. The winner of the presidential election is the person who receives a majority of the Electoral College's 538 votes, regardless of which candidate wins the popular election. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact seeks to change this arrangement. States joining the compact agree to allocate their votes based on the results of the national popular vote. This means that if the compact were joined by enough states to constitute a majority of seats in the Electoral College, and the compact by its terms would not go into effect unless it did, the winner of the national popular vote would be guaranteed to win the presidency. Choosing presidents based on the national popular vote would alter the way candidates campaign and would change the balance of power between the states. The Electoral College encourages candidates to concentrate on swing states, but the compact would encourage candidates to seek the greatest possible total number of votes, and the most efficient way to do that would be to concentrate on the country's population centers. For that reason, a national popular vote plan would be expected to shift power to the high population areas on the coasts. Some argue that the compact violates the interstate compacts clause of the constitution, which prohibits states from entering into compacts with each other without the consent of Congress. These opponents of the compact claim that the constitution forbids interstate agreements that alter the distribution of power between states, and they argue that the compact would do exactly that by subverting the electoral college. The compact would undermine the protection the Electoral College gives to small states, and the compact would instruct electors to reject their own state's interests and the views of their state's voters in favor of the candidate who received the most votes across the nation. Thus, the compact would take a system based on the Great Compromise's balance of power between large and small states and replace it with pure majoritarianism. Defenders of the compact, however, argue that the interstate compact clause outlaws only those interstate agreements that undermine the supremacy of the national government over the states. Because the compact simply changes the means of choosing the president, it would do nothing to alter the powers of the presidency, the national government, or the states as a group. Therefore, they argue, the compact is constitutional. Further, defenders of the compact argue, 
Nothing in the Constitution tells the states how they must allocate their electors. If they want to appoint electors based on the national popular vote, the Constitution leaves that choice up to them. The National Popular Vote Interstate Compact has not yet gained enough states to go into effect, but if it does, it will certainly be challenged in court. But for now, the constitutionality of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact remains an open question. Again, this is a version of whether we are a compact of states or are we a compact of people. And it would ultimately be a case that would wind up in the Supreme Court. Each state would award their electoral votes to the popular vote winner, no matter who wins in their state. In other words, for those people who believe in states' rights, they would say, hey, I voted for a candidate X, and you're giving my vote to candidate Y, and therefore you're not representing my interests. So that might wind up in the Supreme Court. Uh, in other words, we've got to get to more than 270 votes uh, would be represented in the compact before this could begin to happen. So far, 16 states with 196 votes have passed it, 74 more are needed. Include in four small states, eight medium states, three big states in the District of Columbia. Notice any pattern here. It does tend to be the blue states that are more often represented in preferring this system. It sounds good, but the Constitution that we just went over in that video that they cannot enter into any agreement or compact with another state. And therefore, would that mean it is unconstitutional and only the Supreme Court would be able to decide that. Uh, it's been passed in a total of 41 state legislative bodies, in either one, at least one body, nine states possessing electoral votes unanimously approved at the committee level in two states possessing 27 more electoral votes. And it's been introduced in various years in all 50 states. Colorado enacted it into law, but it's subject to a statewide vote in November, 2020. Then the question of faithless electors. A faithless elector is a member of the United States Electoral College who does not vote for the presidential or vice presidential candidate for whom they had pledged to vote. And that has happened on 22 occasions. 179 electors have not cast their, can their votes for the person they were elected to represent. And uh, in 1836, 23 Virginia electors voted no to Vice President Johnson. 21 states have no mandatory voting. 29 states plus the District of Columbia have laws to penalize faithless electors. It's never been enforced, however. Meaningfully, on July 6, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that states have the power to require presidential electors to vote for their party's candidate for president. But that only applies to the 20, 29 states that already have that law on their books. Conclusion, the Electoral College is very, very difficult to change. Terrible as it is, awful as it may be, as uh, miscarried as it may have been a couple of times. It has worked. We have elected a president and they have gone on to take office peacefully, uh, except for 2000. And that is crucial, by the way. 1800, 1824, 1872, 76, and 2000. A lot of controversy in all of those elections, but even as awful as the agony of 2020, turned out to be, we did get a president when all was said and done. The momentum for change dissipates once a new president takes office. There was a lot of talk about this last October and November and December and January. But since then, since we have a new president in office, nobody is spending much time thinking about this. So frankly, my judgment is it's unlikely to change. Get used to it and enjoy our new president, if you can. I call this the end. Well, actually, it never does end. This is one of those uh, discussions, one of those battles that has a long, long life ahead of them. Uh, I find it fascinating to think about this. I find it intriguing to try to re-debate it every you know, 
four years. Um, and I know that the only thing we have in front of us is the uncertainty. And uh, I think that uh, as tenacious and as flexible as we are as a nation, uh, we will survive all of the problems like this one that are confronting us throughout the coming decades. Anyway, it's been a pleasure presenting this program to you. I hope it has been helpful to elucidate your understanding of this mysterious thing called the Electoral College and uh, that you join me for other presentations that I do from time to time. Anyway, thank you so much. I look forward to future presentations and more discussion of US history and government.